absolutely anticipated this thing. We knew it was going to happen exactly as it did go down, with one exception. And here's where I just, and then I'm, I'm going to finish this, and then I'll open the floor to questions. Um, the, uh, what, what, it, what I have learned since then, now all the things that I've told you are things I did directly. So I'm telling you, I'm not relating what somebody else did or a conversation that somebody else had that has been reported to me. This is direct primary knowledge from my own experience. But what I'm going to tell you now is from somebody else, okay? And so I, I distinguish these two things. I have been told that some, by somebody who saw the videos that at the World Trade Center on approximately, from approximately August 23rd, and it could have been August 22nd, it could have been August 24th. Okay, approximately August 23rd until approximately September 3rd. And again, it could be September 2nd. The spooks can be weird about this stuff. Okay, they could say, well, there, it wasn't September 4th. So no. No, it could have been September 3rd, okay? It could have been September 2nd. Right in, within a couple of days of this, my friend says that between the, at, at, at approximately 3 o'clock in the morning, strange vans, and there were just maybe three of them, he said, that not just a couple. The way he put it was a couple of vans. So we're thinking three, possibly four, but most likely three. A couple of vans arrived at 3 o'clock in the morning after the janitorial trucks had left the building. And it's very important because they were able to identify the vans according to make, model, color, and uh, there were no markings on the vans. But the janitorial vans did have markings. And so they were able to distinguish that these are not the same vans. And they know how the janitorial trucks left the building and the, they actually tracked the paths that the janitorial trucks took to drive home. Like the janitorial workers were driving down certain roads to get over to, to their houses, and the CIA, or the FBI, the NSA folks tracked those people home. Um, and they're they're, he was quite convinced that these are not the same trucks. And between the hours of 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock, these trucks had never been in this building before. It was an anomaly. Definitely, it wasn't like it was going on for months and months, and it just continued. They showed up for 10 days, 10 or 11 days approximately, then they were never seen again. And that's when they believe they wired the building. And they do believe, and, and, and my friend told me absolutely it was a thermite bomb, a thermite bomb with a, th it was a thermite bomb with a potential sulfur in it. Yeah. The sulfur it makes it, uh, it is a, uh, the, 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 the important thing about a thermite bomb is it is a, it is a, an extraordinary heat-reducing bomb. Okay, it, it, it's, it, creates, it takes steel and it creates molten steel. So it takes beams of steel and it turns it into molten steel. And it just rot, everything underneath just sinks into the ground like what you saw. And it is, it is, a, it is, a, it is a special U.S. military-grade weapon. Okay? It is a military-grade weapon. It's not something you could make ever in your kitchen or your, or your garage or your, or your living room. It is impossible for you to do this. This is a US military weapon. And so I, uh, I do believe that that helps to explain uh, some, of the, the missing, some of the missing pieces. And I believe this is what happened. Uh, they had known in it, they'd known about the terrorist attack for months. There is a long-term advanced knowledge Assets are being watched. The 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 terror the so-called terrorists, whether you want to think of them as re whether whether they're real, Mohammed Atta was an asset trained by the United States government, supervised by the United States government. And I can assure you that assets, and I'm speaking directly from my own personal experience, assets are heavily controlled individuals. I was never dealing with Iraq and Libya without somebody paying extremely close attention to me at every stage, and my phones were tapped. I mean, at some point, they, they, had, they had wired my house. <laughs> when they had the handover of the two Libyan men, I went down to my basement the same day that they handed over the men, and my ceiling of my basement had been torn out, and there were cable wires dangling from the ceiling, about a dozen cable wires. And I had a contractor come over to my house, and he said, wow, 
you really, somebody really put a kick-ass stereo system in your house. That's amazing. He said, you have, you have these wires going to every single room of your house, even in your bathroom. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you know. But yeah, but he, we, he was like, they, he said, it's everywhere. He said, you must have like a stereo system that just, you know, rocks <laughs> in this house. Um, but it, it, so anyway, the, but the point is, is that assets, they, they, there's no way that these assets could have functioned without everyone knowing every single detail of what they were doing. There's no way they could have hidden. They could not have disguised their actions from their handlers. Even if they tried to disguise it, it wouldn't work. Believe me, it wouldn't work. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, you know, no, it's impossible. Impossible. And so it's more likely that they were using Muhammad Atta to guide the conspiracy to track the conspiracy, and then they discovered that they were bozo pilots, they were clowns, they weren't any good at this flying stuff, and now they had an agenda. And the agenda was that when this attack happened, they were gonna go to war with Iraq. But oh gosh, we've got a problem now. Because the problem is they're not gonna be able to do the job. Uh-oh, oh, what a bummer. We're not going to be able, if, if, see, see, here's the thing about all, and I'm speaking now, for, again, from experience. The 1993 World Trade Center attack killed five people. The, the bombing of the USS Cole killed 12 people. And once the smoke and clears and the catastrophe, the chaos is over and the noise is done, it's pretty, you know, it's like, it's, it's all, there's not a lot of damage that would just, that would certainly not enough that would allow a government, a pro-war cabal, to throw itself into a new war with Iraq, which they wanted to do. They'd already decided to do it. And so, that is the motivation. There can, the thing is, there can never be a, any police officer will tell you, there is no crime without a motive and opportunity. And we had both. So it's not like they just spontaneously wired the World Trade Center. They knew it was coming, and they wanted to make sure that they had maximum damage when it hit. They knew they were going to use the airplanes as the cover to demolish the building. So it's not, you know, a lot of people in the 9-11 truth community have gotten kind of, at first, when I first broke this news, they were like, you know, a lot of people attacked me, and they said, you're saying there were airplane hijackings. No, no, there was a demolition. And I'm like saying, no, no, there's both of it. Both things happened. They, they, knew this, they, they knew the airplanes were going to be hijacked, so they used it as a cover for the, to, to guarantee maximum destruction because they already knew the consequence of war. So, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, and, okay, yeah. I forget what you said that your job was, your go-between. Uh, I was a, a, what's called an asset. Right, okay. I, I was an intelligence asset. I was supervised by handlers for the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency. I was not covert. This is very, I was covert from your end. Like you guys, the American people had no idea that Clinton, President Clinton had opened up a back channel because they didn't want you all to know this. But in fact, the, from the very first meetings that I have at the Iraqi embassy and the Libyan embassy, they were told who I was. They knew that I was a, a passionate anti-sanctions activist and passionately anti-war. I hated the first Gulf War, had protested the Gulf War, and uh, I wanted to do anything that I could to try to create a communications they couldn't have a formal communications because of the sanctions. They were officially on the pariah list, and yet they had to have some kind of communications and discussion in order to, res in order to on terrorism specifically. So my question is, um, you were a back channel between everybody. I, I, I find it odd that your boss doesn't talk to the people in the administration. Oh, they did. They send you over there to yell at people well, they, no, no, or they, tell them no. I, I think that he did. I, I know that he did. So I know that he did. What, what, what he did, what he did was, uh, I, believe, I believe, and I could be wrong about this, but I believe that he contributed to the White House memo on uh, the, 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 the presidential 
directive, instruction, request. <laughs> there's, a, there's a formal term for that. I'm afraid I don't know what it is. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. He did contribute to that. And he had vastly more information than I did. I was getting all my knowledge from him. But the fact that we needed some, we needed fast turnaround on this because we thought the attack was within a couple of weeks. In fact, the attack didn't occur for another, this was August 6th and it occurred over a month later. But we thought that the attack could come as early as, you know, the third or fourth week of August. We thought it was imminent. And so, well, he, he probably did also. Everybody was doing it. See, this is the thing that, I mean, not, no offense, but there was so much discussion about this attack. Everybody was talking about it. George Tennant had some meetings. Other, other analysts had meetings at the White House that Condoleezza Rice has like conveniently pretended didn't happen. Um, but there, there, was a, there was a lot of knowledge. And, and the fact that I would be able to get the Attorney General's attention, the staff attention, by saying I'm in direct contact with Iraq. That's kind of like a, that's like a bona fide thing that in the CIA. That's like a, they call it bona fide. So more information to them is better. Yeah, exactly. We were, we were, and it wasn't like a supervisory thing at that point. They wanted someone with direct contact, because I had direct contact with the events, and I could cite that and say, you need to listen to me, because I speak with the, I spoke with the Iraqis on Saturday, and I need to tell you this. I spoke, you know, you see what I mean? Yeah. So that's, I'm sure he also did, I'm, I know he did other things too. Okay. Um, in the course of your talk, uh, what I haven't heard is any real evidence that there was a genuine uh, jihadi plot. Um, maybe that's in your book, but you haven't... Um, said anything to show me that uh, such a plot existed. In fact, the impression I get from the evidence that you presented about what your bosses were talking about and what was going on in the U.S. government is that the U.S. government was um, trying to create a predictive um, situation yes. with this attack. Yes. Um, which, in my opinion, could well have been the sum and substance of the attack, and that, um, you know, as I said, I haven't seen anything that you said that shows me that there was a genuine jihadi uh, plot. Uh, you know, this is a very good question because <laughs> it's really questionable that there was a jihadi plot. I do believe there were hijackers. Now, I, I have to tell you that I do believe there were hijackers. On the other hand, I know that they were the people that they did identify were assets. Okay, they worked for the United States government, and they were the men who did who were identified as the the the, uh, the the hijackers were not jihadis. They were not devoutly religious men. Uh, they went to strip clubs. They drank alcohol. They dr smoked cigarettes. They chased women. Real, real deep, authentic jihadis would do none of that. They they were you know and and so. It's really curious to me as to what their, I, I, and I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately, but what their final minutes must have been on this earth. What did they think they were doing? I, I truly do not know. I don't know if they thought it was just a training exercise. I don't know if they thought, I, I just don't know. But I don't think, I do not believe they were jihad, real jihadis. when the CIA and uh, elements in the U.S. government became, may have become concerned that uh, having planned this event, prepared for it, that the uh, alleged jihadi pilots weren't going to be able to uh, accomplish the goal. Yeah. Well, now, according to the official version of 9-11, they did accomplish the goal of flying the airplanes into the buildings. And so, um, do you think that the CIA made a mistake and underestimated the well, talent of these pilots? Well, 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 well here's the thing. 